Alrighty, so today we're going to be talking about isotopes. And we kind of briefly touched on these in our discussion of what makes up the atom, but we're going to go into a little bit more detail today on isotopes. So, what are isotopes? Like we said, different atoms of the same element can have different number of neutrons. When this happens, these atoms are called isotopes. So they have the same number of protons because they are the same element, but they have different number of neutrons. Isotopes can occur naturally or can be man-made, and they play a part, a huge part in determining the atomic mass of the element because the atomic mass of the element comes from the mass of the protons and the mass of the neutrons. Now let's take a look at some different isotopes. So carbon has three different isotopes, carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14. Now here I'm having to give the mass number of each of the elements because that's telling me the different isotope of carbon that we're talking about. Remember how I said that the average atomic mass is the average weighted mass of all the different isotopes. So if we want to specifically talk about them, because they have different number of neutrons, I have to indicate that. Now they have the same number of protons, but they have different number of neutrons. So that's how they can be carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14. In, each, in carbon 13, I have one more, pro, one more neutron. Carbon 14 has two more neutrons. Uh, we also have potassium, which has potassium 39, potassium 40, and potassium 41. Uh, uranium has different isotopes, uranium-234, 235, and 238. And then hydrogen actually has different isotopes. Hydrogen uh, um, is special, though, in that each of its isotopes actually has a different name. You have hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium. Hydrogen is a one-to-one, -one, so hydrogen-1 is usually what it's called. Deuterium is H2. Tritium is H3, where here, hydrogen only had one proton. If you add a neutron, you get deuterium. You add two neutrons, you get tritium. So hydrogen itself actually has no neutrons, but it's still an element. It's got a proton. So, but its isotopes then are adding neutrons on. Now, interestingly enough, isotopes can actually be radioactive. Some of these isotopes, when you mess with, we talked about Maria Giopremer's um, magic numbers. Sometimes when you add another neutron, you actually create instability. And so these are not stable, uh, stable atoms or stable isotopes, and so they are radioactive, and that they have to decay to try and become neutral. And we'll talk more about this when uh, we get to our nuclear unit. But carbon has a radioactive isotope, that would be carbon-14, that's why we do carbon-14 dating. Potassium is potassium-40, and then uranium, actually all three of their isotopes are radioactive. Now, uranium does have, um, some of them are, have longer half-lives, so they, they last a little bit longer, um, and we'll talk about that later, but just so you know, isotopes do not all have to be stable, some of them are unstable or radioactive. Now, atomic mass. So we talked directly about the fact that the isotopes directly affect atomic mass because atomic mass is the mass of protons and neutrons. So if you're changing up that mass, or the number of neutrons, you're changing up the mass. And our atomic mass is the weighted average of all the mass of all the isotopes. And so the way that we write that is atomic mass. And we have to do, it's a weighted average because some of the isotopes are gonna be more abundant than others. And so we take the percent abundant of isotope 1 and multiply it by its mass, plus the percent abundant of isotope 2 multiplied by its mass, plus all the other isotopes. And that way you get a weighted average because if you've got more of one isotope than another, it's going to affect the average because you're more likely to encounter that atom with that mass. And so we have to take that into account by doing that weighted average. So for example, Chlorine-35 has an atomic mass of 34.968852 AMUs, or atomic mass units, and it's 75.77% abundant. Chlorine-37, another isotope of chlorine, has an atomic mass of 36.965303 AMU, and is 24.23% abundant. So to find and determine the atomic mass of chlorine, 
we're going to have to um, multiply that percent abundance by the mass. So I have my mass times my percent abundance, but we take the percentage and we make it a decimal, so divided by 100, plus my percent abundance times its, my percent abundance times its mass. And you get 35.45 AMU. Now you'll notice that chlorine 35 with its mass of 34.968852 AMU is the more abundant, it's three quarter percent abundant. So it's not surprising then that the mass, the average weighted mass is closer to the chlorine 35 mass than the chlorine 37 mass because more of them are chlorine 35. So the average weighted average atomic mass should be closer to 35. So that whole idea, that's, that's gonna be our equation that we use. And knowing this, we can actually solve for a bunch of different things, not just the average atomic mass. If you were given the percent of abundance of one of the isotopes and the percent abundance and mass of the other isotope, you can use the average atomic mass from the periodic table to find the mass of the isotope that is unknown. So just like when we were doing Q equals MC delta T and we could solve for any one of the variables, you can solve for the same thing here as long as you know the other ones. So for example, potassium has three naturally occurring isotopes. Potassium 39 is 93.2581% abundant with a mass of 38.9963707 AMU. Potassium 40 is 0.0117% abundant with a mass of 39.963999 AMU. And potassium 41 is 6.73% abundant. Using the average atomic mass of potassium of 39.098 AMU, what is the mass of the potassium 41 isotope? So we're gonna plug, we've got this equation, isotope one times its mass times percent abundance of isotope two times its mass plus percent abundance of isotope three times its mass. And we know the average atomic mass, so we can plug that in. So we get 39.098 AMU. And it's all just about plugging things in. So isotope one, we're gonna go with, it's got a percent abundance of 93.2581%, so that becomes 0.932581 times its mass, 38.9963707 AMU, plus the percent abundance of potassium 40, which is really small, 0.0117%, so that becomes 0.000117 times its mass, plus the percent abundance, 6.73%, which is 0.0673%, times the mass that we're trying to solve for, K43 AMU. Now, what we do is we're gonna multiply these out. So we're gonna multiply the percent abundances by the masses and we'll get new just AMUs and still our little va our va variable that we're trying to solve for, sorry. Now, I see some things that are like. So I'm going to combine like terms. So I'm gonna combine those two atomic mass units and I'm gonna get 39.098 AMU is equal to 36.3719507 AMU plus this variable. And then I'm gonna combine and try and get like terms together again. And I'm gonna combine those two terms. So I'm gonna actually subtract 36.3719507 from the right side and subtract it from the left side so that I can get my variable that I'm trying to solve for by itself. So then I get 2.72604928 AMU is equal to point 0673K41. So in order to solve for the mass that I'm trying to solve for with K41, I'm gonna divide both sides by 0 0.0673. And I get 40.5059410 AMU for potassium 41. So using sig figs, the, or significant figures, which I think I actually have that wrong, that should just be three sig figs. I get 40.506 AMU, okay? So you can solve for anything. You just have to kind of keep those, keep like terms together and um, keep track of everything. So it's it's kind of like the specific heat and that they get big, but they're not all that scary. It's just multiplication and division and addition, um, but it can be a little tricky. Now, the trickiest math that we can do with isotope calculations actually involves elements with only two known isotopes. Here we can actually find the percent abundance of both isotopes by doing some algebra, which is exciting. We just have to remember that the percent abundance of all isotopes, or just two in the cases like this, must add up to 100%.
So if we keep that in mind, we can actually do some pretty cool math. So for example, boron has two known naturally occurring isotopes, boron 10 with a mass of 10.012937 AMU, and boron 11 with mass of 11.009305 AMU. If boron's average atomic mass is 10.811 AMU, what's the percent abundance of each of its isotopes? So you might be thinking, huh, how am I supposed to figure this out? And here's how you figure it out. Because we know that the average atomic mass is the percent of isotope one times the mass plus the percent of isotope two, and we know that there's only two isotopes, we know that the percent abundance of both of these isotopes must equal 100%. Now, we don't write these percentages in this calculation as 100%, we write it as a decimal. Well, 100% divided by 100 is one. And so I know that the percent of isotope one and the percent of isotope two is gonna be equal to one, or x plus y is gonna be equal to one. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know how to solve for two different variables at the same time. I do, however, know how to solve for the same variable in relationship to another variable. So I can say that x plus y equals one, or that y is equal to one minus x. And if I plug in one minus x in for y, I can solve for x and figure out the percent abundance of both isotopes at the same time. So what we can do is average atomic mass is equal to x of mass one plus one minus x of mass two. So let's plug in some numbers there. We know that the average atomic mass of boron is 10.8811 AMU. And then we've got the, the masses of the two different isotopes. So if I plug those in, the next thing I need to do is I need to expand this and factor it in. So I'm gonna get 10.811 AMU. And then I've got some like terms that I can combine. So I can combine those, my two variables, my two X's together and we get 10.881 AMU is equal to negative 0.996368 AMU times X. Again, that's negative, keep track of that, plus 11.009305 AMU. I'm gonna combine some more like terms because I've got two just AMUs together. So I'm gonna have to subtract that over to the other side. So I get negative 0.198305 AMU is equal to negative 0.996368 AMU times X. To solve for x, I'm just gonna divide both sides by negative 0.996368, and I get x is equal to 0 0.1990, 0 0.027869. Now, y is then gonna be equal to one minus x, so y is gonna be equal to 0.8009721. One. Now, those don't look much like percent abundances at this point, so to find out the percent abundances, I need to multiply each of them by 100. So 0 0.1990278690 times 100 is gonna be equal to 19.903%, which is the percent abundance of isotope B10, or boron 10, because that was the mass that was associated with boron 10, and that's the one that I said was isotope one or X. And then um, taking 0 0.8009721 times 100, I get an 80 point 0.97% abundance for boron 11. So that, again, that's the hardest it's gonna get, and you just have to remember that x plus y is equal to one, so y is one minus x, not x minus one. So keep that in mind, and we're gonna do a lot of practice with these. But that's the trickiest math that we're gonna be doing. Okay, so we're gonna talk more about this tomorrow. Come in ready to teach me all that you've learned, and we'll practice it together. Have a good night, guys.